if you would stand to your feet, we're going to read uh, from the book of Daniel. We'll never know what you're going to get when you come to me. We're going to read from the book of Daniel, chapter 5. Please stand to your feet if you're able. If you're not, we, we, we understand. Praise the Lord. Uh, but Daniel 5, we're going to begin reading at verse 1. We're going to read verses 1 through 8. And then uh, we're going to skip down to verse 11. We're going to read 11 and 12. Amen. amen. Daniel 5. Amen. That is one of the major prophets that comes after the books of wisdom in the Bible. So if you if you get to Psalms, it's not far after that. Amen. It's after all of them other Jeremiah and Ezekiel and all them guys. Amen. Everybody have if you have Daniel five, say amen. Amen. If you don't have it, say give me another minute. All right, y'all all have it. If you don't, y'all faking me out. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go for it. But we're gonna read beginning from verse one through verse eight. Then again, as I said, skip down to eleven and twelve. So if you're ready to read, let's say, uh, let's read the Bible. And the Bible says, Belshazzar, the king, made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. Belshazzar, whilst he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels, which his father, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem that the king and his princes, his wives, and his concubines might drink therein. Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem, and the king and his princes, his wives, and his concubines drank in them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and of silver, of brass, of iron, of wood and of stone. In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance was changed and his thoughts troubled him so that the joints of his loins were loose and his knees smote one against another. The king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. And the king spake and said to the wise men of Babylon, Whosoever shall read this writing and show me the interpretation thereof shall be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold about his neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then came in all the king's wise men but they could not read the writing, nor make known to the king the interpretation thereof. Let's go to verse 11, church. There is a man in thy kingdom, in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And in the days of thy father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, was found in him. Whom the king Nebuchadnezzar, thy father the king, I say, thy father, made master of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. For as much as an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding, interpreting of dreams, and showing of hard sentences, and dissolving of doubts, were found in the same Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will show the interpretation. Amen. Amen. That is the word of God for the people of God. You may be seated in the presence of God. Let us pray. Eternal God, we come again standing behind this sacred desk asking for preaching power asking you, Father God, that you would decrease me and increase in me. Asking, Father God, that you would let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Father God, asking that somebody here would hear something that'll make them better than when they came. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
Amen. Now, the text that we read together from the prophetic book of Daniel is actually a fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah. Some 200 years earlier, Isaiah had predicted that a king by the name of Cyrus would capture Babylon and that would be the beginning of the ending, the begin of the ending of the captivity of the children of Israel. Jeremiah also prophesied that the Babylon rule over Judah would last 70 years. got to remember in the text that we read this is occurring in Babylon. Daniel was one of the best and the brightest that they took from Jerusalem and brought to Babylon. Now this lesson is situated in the Bible in between the time where the three Hebrew boys were thrown into the fiery furnace and and in between the time where Daniel was thrown into the lion's den. So we pick up the lesson 70 years are now up. And the prophecy of Jeremiah is about to become reality. And you see the Medo-Persians had this powerful army. And, and they were in the process of taking over the landscape of what we now call the Middle East. And pretty much in that time it was uh, pretty much the known world. They were led by this king named Cyrus. Very powerful, very successful in war. And, and King Cyrus had engaged in battle with uh, Belshazzar and he routed him in his army and Belshazzar retreated back into Babylon. King Cyrus then surrounded Babylon and, and he had King Belshazzar and the Babylonians under siege. Now, now, Babylon was a fortified city. It had 30 foot high walls and it had gates that you could only enter in through a river. So if they did not open the gates, you could not get in. And they had stored up wheat in Babylon for uh, enough that would have them and carry them through for several years. And you see, it was important to know that the Euphrates River ran directly through the city of Babylon and, and those gates, once those gates were closed, there was no way you could attack them. So Belshazzar was, was content and he was confident that he was safe inside of Babylon. So when we pick up the lesson in verse 5, Belshazzar is having a party even though the enemy is right outside of his city. But because he's partying, he doesn't know that Cyrus is building a dam to stop the river so his army can have access to the city and attack. So on today, our thought for this message, our thought is, you reap what you sow. Sound like y'all know. Y'all know a little something about that. You reap what you sow. So, again, this fifth chapter opens up with a party. Much like in the book of Esther, Esther opens up with a party too. But all the difference is uh, the party in Esther was a celebration of a war victory, and this party was, was a party after the defeat. The king actually was in more trouble than he realized. And instead of keeping a steady watch, he got comfortable, and he decided to drown his sorrows. Uh-oh. Can I teach you a little bit? There are folks out there who thinks that when problems come, they can drink them away. 
But beloved, let me tell you something. The same problems you had before you got drunk. When you sober up, they're going to be right there. Amen. Folks try to self-medicate themselves. They end up getting deeper in trouble because alcohol causes more problems than it solves. So the king is having a party. And the Bible tells us that he's been sipping. Y'all know what sipping is. Y'all, 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 y'all too saved to know what sipping is. Now I know. And after he's tipsy, then he decides to call for the holy vessels of Jerusalem. Now, it's sacrilegious to use the holy vessels for anything other than worship purposes. But Belshazzar, he's feeling himself. He got that liquid courage. And he decides to disgrace God by disrespecting the sacred temple cups and the bowls. See, beloved, sometimes folks will try to make you look bad so they make themselves look good. So Belshazzar thought he could impress the people by denigrating God. So watch this. Not only did he disrespect the vessels by drinking from them, but he used them to worship other false gods. Look at somebody and say, you reap what you sow. <laughs> now, see these temple bowls are made of silver and gold and Belshazzar used them to symbolize the gods that his people worship. And those gods he worshiped, they were made of silver and gold and wood and brass and iron and stone. And I imagine, I wasn't there, but I can use my imagination if I want to. I imagine the more inebriated they became, the more they used the vessels to celebrate the heathen gods that they were worshiping. But the thing about sacrilege and blasphemy is, the more you do it, the more wrath you bring upon yourself. Uh, church is like being in quicksand. The more you wiggle, the deeper you sink. And Belshazzar is in his feelings in the text. See, because he thinks he's got the Persians at bay, but he knows they are a problem. He knows he can't defeat them, so he's trying to wait them out. So what happens when that, you, you know, here's what happens. See, you got a bully, and there's a bigger bully that can beat him. So the bully will turn around then and pick on somebody that they know they can beat. So Belshazzar he knows he's already conquered Judah, feels superior to him, and he shows off this superiority, superiority by pushing disrespect to the limit. He said, not only am I going to drink wine out of the holy vessels, but I'm going to use them as a symbol of the pagan gods that I worship. Belshazzar is literally saying, I'm going to spit in the face of Jehovah and Judah. He could do it because he felt like he had the people of, of Judah in captivity. Their temple was destroyed. And now he's in a position where he's holding off the Persian army. Thought he was safe in Babylon. They were fought a 30 foot wall. He thought he was safe. But you know what he really was acting like? He was acting like the little dog behind the fence that barked real loud when the big dog come by. You seen that, right? What happened is one day somebody gonna leave the gate open. Or somebody ain't gonna let that dog off the leash. This is where Belshazzar is. But in verse 5 of this text that we read, 
we see God's had enough of the disrespect. And just as God had given power to Nebuchadnezzar, he moved to take away power from Belshazzar. See, the same God that can put you in charge can remove you out of charge. So, so during the celebration, after he's good and tipsy, Belshazzar, now he starts seeing things. He sees the fingers of a man's hand writing on the wall of the palace. There wasn't a body connected to these fingers. There was just fingers writing on the wall. Now, we got to look closely at the text because there's something wrong with that picture. Let's review. See, the text tells us there was a thousand people at the party. They were drinking. They were having fun. But, but now the king gets the idea and says, go, let me go get the holy vessels. Let's drink out of them. Now, wait a minute. Not only that, but hey, let's, let's uh, use them to symbolize the pagan gods that we serve. God had enough. Look at somebody say, you reap what you sow. And all of a sudden, the king sees a vision. The text don't tell us nobody else didn't see it, but the king saw it. Now, 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 here's a problem. If we take this to 2017, here's a problem. If you had a party with a whole bunch of people, and something crazy like that happens, but only you see it, here's what I can tell you. Put, cut yourself off. Put down whatever you, whatever's in your hand. Don't drive home, call Uber, Lyft, or a friend, or if you if you able, walk home. <laughs> Belshazzar sees these fingers and it shook them up. We see in verse 6, the king is shook. The Bible says his countenance was changed. You know what that means? That means he either turned white as a ghost or red as a bee. <laughs> the Bible says his thoughts troubled him. See, God will cause your own thoughts to convict you. And when you're contrary to the will of the Lord, you'll be convicted in your own conscience. Now, in this case, his guilt was so severe, uh, he was so afraid, the Bible says, watch this, the joints of his loins were loose. Y'all don't know what that means, but I'm going to tell you. Now, now, the Hebrew translation, translation of the word loins can also be used to mean bowels. Mm. I'm going to read it again. The joints of his bowels were loosed. Mm. I'm going to let you use your own deductive reasoning to figure out what that means. <laughs> he was scared. <laughs> and to further illustrate the terror of the king, the verse says that his knees smote one against the other. Never so scared that your knees knock. <laughs> Belshazzar saw his hand writing on the wall and got scared. But beloved, isn't it amazing how you could be partying and having a ball and the next minute you so afraid that your bowels release and your knees knocking? But see, beloved, when you get in trouble, when we get in trouble, because we know God, prayer and fasting will get you out. Those of us who have a relationship with God, we can always pray our way out of trouble. But when you don't know God and you don't have a relationship with him, you'll find yourself calling on the wrong people in the time of trouble. And that's what Belshazzar did. He called on the astrologers and the soothsayers because he wanted to know what the fingers wrote yeah. on the wall. Here's, here's what's interesting to me in the text. And its application for our lives is three things. Watch this. Verse 7 says, he cried aloud to bring in folks to help understand what the writing said. And he then offers a reward to anyone who could read it and interpret it. Look at somebody and say, the party over now. <laughs> Three things I want to I want to point out in the text. One, all of them could see what was written, 
But none of them knew what it said. And, and how we can we apply that to our lives? See, just because somebody can see your problem, don't mean that they can fix it. Look at somebody and say, just seeing don't help me. So the king called on men who had expertise. But see, he needed to call on men who had a relationship with God. They, look, there are going to be times in your life that problems are going to come in and people in your life who don't have a relationship with God, they're not going to be able to help you out of your situation. Look at somebody and tell them, say, you got to know who to call. Point number three. The king offered a reward to the man who could help him read and interpret the writing on the wall. But beloved, there they ain't enough money in the world to pay somebody to tell you what God says if they don't have a relationship with it. You, you can't buy your way out of judgment. Nobody in the king's court could tell him what the writing said or what it meant. So watch this. The king mother come in. See, sometimes you get in trouble, can't nobody help you but mama. Sometimes you get jammed up bad enough. The only person that can come is mom. Mama come and mama say, I'm paraphrasing. Uh, I'm paraphrasing right now. Don't, don't, this ain't what the Bible actually say. I'm just kind of giving it to you. You know, the, 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 yeah, the Thomas interpretation. Mama say, what's wrong with you, boy? You better get yourself together. Because there's a man in your kingdom who has a relationship with God. He has wisdom and understanding. This man is the master of your magicians and the astrologers and the wise men, and, and, and the men that you ask and help from, he their boss. That's who you need to call. So this man, he got an excellent spirit, and he's no, he has knowledge, he got understanding, and he can comprehend difficult sentences, and he's able to dissolve doubts. And his name is Daniel. Mama said, call him. He'll show you what words, he'll show you what the words say. So the king listened to his mama. He called Daniel. Now, Daniel got to be close to 90 years old now. He was a teenager when he was brought to Babylon, but now it's 70 years later. And see, folk that live long enough, they don't hold their tongue when you ask them questions. If you want to get the real truth, ask somebody that lived a long time. They'll tell you the truth. And Daniel don't hold his tongue when he talks to Belshazzar. And Belshazzar offers Daniel the reward that he offered the other men. And Daniel tells the king, you can keep your reward. He said, I'm going to tell you what the writing says, but I don't want nothing from you. All I want to do is just tell you how bad you done messed up. He says to the king, he said, look, God gave your father, really, uh, it was really Belshazzar's grandfather, but God gave your father Nebuchadnezzar a kingdom and he gave him glory and honor. And your father didn't do it for himself. And all the riches and majesty that he had, God gave it to him. Yeah, yeah. But he was ungrateful and he chose to kill who he wanted to kill and he chose to keep alive who he wanted to keep alive. Yeah. And Daniel said Nebuchadnezzar was filled with pride and that's why he was removed by God. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, and you knew about it, and you still didn't have no humility. He said, instead, you fought against God, and you done brought the holy vessels in to drink and get drunk out of them and use them for worship purposes. Watch this. He said, you used them as symbols of gods of silver and gold and brass and iron and stone. And none of them gods that you worshiping, they can't see nothing, they can't hear nothing, and they don't know nothing. And you ignore the God who places the breath in your body. Now, isn't it interesting that God 
gives us free will. Yeah. Isn't it? But the things that keep us alive, yeah. we don't have no control over. Ain't nobody in here that can stop yourself from breathing if you wanted to. God controls that. God doesn't give you the ability to control your own breathing. Your heart beat. Your heart start beating, you'll pass away. You can't control that. The things that keep us alive, God controls. Yeah, yeah. Daniel tells Belshazzar, he says, the one who is doing these things for you, you're ignoring him, you're disrespecting him, you're a disgrace. Turn to somebody and say, you reap what you sow. So after Daniel tells Belshazzar what he thought, then he answers the question. He said, the fingers that you saw writing on the wall, those were God's fingers. Those were the same fingers that wrote the Ten Commandments on top of Mount Sinai. And he said, what, what those words on the wall mean, I'm going to tell you what they mean. Many, M-E-N-E, -E, means God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel, T-E-K-E-L, means you, you have been evaluated and found wanting. And Perez, P-E-R-E-S, means the Persians and the Medes are going to take over your kingdom. Daniel says, Belshazzar, you done messed with the wrong God. And you reap what you sow. Can I stay here for a moment? See, if you're so blasphemy, you get wrath. If you're so hate, you get hate back. If you're so jealousy, you get envy back. If you're so misery, you get pain back. Look at somebody and tell them, say, you reap what you sow. You get what you give. What you put in is what you get out. I want to just tell you something topical. If if you afraid or worried about what happened in Virginia today or uh, yesterday, don't worry. Because the same hate that was spit out yesterday is going to be thrown right back in the face of them that was here. You reap what you sow, you get what you give, and what you put in, that's what you get out. But beloved, I, I didn't tell you this message. I didn't tell you this story to to, to, to bring you down this is a positive message because you know why the opposite is true also mm. see the text that our deacon read from Galatians 6 uh, it says be not deceived God is not mocked whatsoever a man soweth that shall he also reap that means you can change the way the world reacts to you you have the power to do that. Look at somebody and tell them, say, you reap what you sow. You get what you give. And what you put in is what you get out. See, if you sow certain things, then you have the right to receive certain things. See, there are things you can cause to happen in your life by simply changing the things that you're sowing. See, if you're constantly in conflict, that means you sow in conflict. If you're constantly in drama, that means you sow in drama. If the issues in your life that you're facing is what comes from what you're sowing in the atmosphere. You reap what you sow. You get what you give. What you put in is what you get out. And guess what? What you put out is what you get back. I'm here, to, I'm here to tell you, look, the world don't have a conspiracy theory against you. If you're sowing misery, that's what you're reaping. People that feel they're, they're treated unfairly and always have a complaint, uh, whether they're, well, whatever they're complaining about is in direct relation to what they're putting out or not putting out. See, you can change what you reap by changing what you sow. If, look, if you plant watermelon seeds, you plant them in the ground, you're going to get a watermelon from out the ground. 
You can't take apple seeds and expect a cherry tree to grow up. And watch this. Even if you have uh, been planting incorrectly for years, you can still change. See, people will remember the last thing you did. You can do a hundred things right. Do one wrong. And that's what they're going to dwell on. But, but your life, because you're a believer, your life uh, operates on kingdom principles. So why don't you sow in your life what you want to receive out of your life? You reap what you sow, you get what you give, and what you put in is what you get out. It's really that simple. If you sow love, you're going to get love. If you sow joy, you're going to get joy. If you sow peace, you're going to get peace. If you sow compassion, you're going to get compassion. If you sow friendship, you're going to have friends. God said in his word, you reap what you sow. What you put in is what you get out. You get what you give. If you bless others, you're going to be blessed. If you care for others, others going to care for you. If you trust folk, folk going to trust you. If you listen to other people, they're going to listen to you too. If you value other folks, they're going to value you too. You can't look down on folks and expect them to look up to you. If you respect others, they gonna respect you. You forgive folk, they'll forgive you too. I'm telling you today, holding a grudge just means you holding on to something that everybody else done already let go of. Look at somebody and just tell them, say you reap what you sow. If you ignore other people, they gonna ignore you. Question people's motives, they gonna question yours too. But if you're so happiness, if you're so love, if you're so joy, if you're so peace, that's what you gonna get back. You are in control of your reaping. And whatever you sow in this world, that's what you're going to reap. you in control of your own happiness, your own joy, your own confidence, your own peace. Look at somebody and tell them, say, I'm changing what I'm sowing. I'm changing what I'm sowing. I'm not sowing no more discord. I'm not sowing no more hate. I'm not sowing no more disappointment. I'm not sowing no more problems. I'm not sowing no more anger. I'm not sowing no more pain. I'm not sowing no more disrespect. I'm not sowing nothing much but love. I'm not sowing no more distress. I'm sowing blessings. I'm going to bless somebody because I understand that when the praises go up, the blessings come down. Oh, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continue to be in my mouth. I'm sowing blessings. I'm not sowing pain. I'm sowing praise. I'm not sowing discord. What you sow. And as long as you're sowing the right thing, as long as your heart is in the right place, as long as you're being faithful, and as long as you got a prayer life, and as long as you have a relationship with God, He's gonna step into your life. He's gonna bring you joy. 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 He's gonna give you peace. He's gonna heal your sickness. He's gonna make you jump for joy. He's gonna give you joy in your heart. Joy for tomorrow. Won't he dry your tears? Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Do you love him? 
what you put in the atmosphere. It's what you put in the atmosphere, that's what you get back. If you sow truth, you're gonna get truth back. If you sow praise, you're gonna get blessings back. If you sow worship, you're going to get a relationship with God back. Got to change what you're sowing. You sow weeds, you're going to grow weeds. And I pray today that when you leave this place, you sow some smiles in some folk life. You sow some hugs in some folk life. You sow some inspiration in some folk life. You control that. Because whatever you sow, that's what you're going to reap. Amen. Let's give God a hand clap of praise. You reap what you sow. God bless you. The doors of the church are open.